hey, we're going to head from the swamp to the stars. As little Timmy Senor is back for a UFO report that has some breaking news tonight. Here we go. Nobody's going to know. They're going to know. Was that a, a wristband that you were putting up there? Uh, no, it's just a thing to, uh, I guess, clean the lens. Just I was going to say, that, that thing's like the size of my watch. Oh, I'm wearing a wristband. Yeah. <laughs> That's purely because of baldness. It gets hot yeah, in it's... here. I've got a lot of gear running. I don't blame you. I just think it's funny that your wristband is about the size of my watch. Yeah, that thing is massive. You're it like is. lifting weights every time you check it the is. time. It is. You know, I'm a big fan of diesel watches. You're into diesel right now. Okay. Uh, I've been into diesel watches for a long time. And I think I got, I think, eight of them now. Wow. Eight of them? Yeah. You're serious. Yeah, I... I, I have a little bit of a fetish with watches. <laughs> I, I counted my watches the other day because I have them all kind of hidden, right? Because just in case somebody, you know, my dogs that decide to, yeah. that my dogs decide to, you know, lick a burglar instead of chasing them out and they become friends with them. Hey, new friend here, right? So I hide my watches. I didn't realize I had 26 of them. 26 watches. And only two wrists. I know. <laughs> this guy. You know, I do like that one that I saw. I think you had it in Denver, and it had a Jaws. It had some teeth. Yes, my Megalodon watch. That is a cool watch. It is I a cool say. watch. That is a yeah. cool one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good time. No, I like I like watches. I like the big faces. Are you wearing an El Avni shirt? I am wearing an El Avni Volador shirt. Why are you supporting that guy? You know, I'm trying to get on his good side. You know, I'm, I'm about peace, love, and light to start this month. That's cool. You're you're a big man for doing that. Well, I don't know if it'll work. Uh, you know, every time I walk around a corner or doorway in my house, I'm wondering if I'm going to be, you know, hit with a steel chair or something along those lines. You never know. This guy. <laughs> you just never know. Hey. Canada making news in the UFO world today. Daniel Otis, the intrepid reporter for CTV News and a good friend of this show, broke a big, big story that it looks like Canadian scientists are going to be leading a new UFO group north of the border. What is going on here? Yeah, exciting news. You're absolutely right. And a little late to the game, but better late than never. Here comes the Canadian government's top scientist launching a study into UAP, the term that is now replacing UFO. Sorry, Dave, up there in Canada. So known as Sky Canada Project, the study begins conducted I'm sorry, the study being conducted by the Office of Chief Science Advisor of Canada is the first known official Canadian UFO research effort in nearly 30 years. And so according to a February 2023 PowerPoint presentation obtained by CTV News, the study seeks to understand how UAP reports are handled in Canada and to offer recommendations for improvements if needed. And so the project plans to collect information this winter and spring before, before preparing an internal draft and report in the fall a final public report in the winter or spring of 2024. And so contained within the nine-page presentation, it looks like they're asking questions that need to be asked, such as who is compiling and analyzing UAP observations made by the Canadians and others. And so I can just kind of hit some of the big points that we have presented or uh, Dave, you can kind of jump in as well. Cause I know you're pretty close to this topic, 
but it looks like as far as any emerging technology or unexplained phenomenon that is reported to the media of interest to the office, it's going to be part of the new report. And so page four of the presentation outlines motivations behind the Sky Canada project, which includes supporting science to, quote, document rare natural phenomenon, encouraging transparency and information access to prevent conspiracy theories, and aiding national security to prevent undetected intrusions. And so it also lists preparing for a collaboration with U.S. officials, where both the Pentagon and NASA are studying the UAP. And so as well as responding to an official request to undertake a comprehensive study on UAPs in Canada, it looks like the Conservative Member of Parliament is part of the push to have this project put together. And so the Chief Science Advisors Project is a signal to the government that the scientific community, the media, and the parliament can no longer ignore this topic. And so even McGuire has been publicly advocated for a program like this since May of 2022. And so the vast majority of reports should be explainable, although it seems like there is a need for the Sky Canada project to lay out a specific scientific plan to do that. And so the government needs to quickly and accurately determine what is in the skies over Canada with a high degree of confidence. And so they're looking at this as needing a whole government approach and including the, chi the chief scientific uh, science officer, rather, creating that post uh, back in 2017 to promote the scientific independence and provide impartial advice to the prime minister and cabinet. And so along with that, we are seeing that there is a push outside the department's mandate for transparency, and they're bringing in Transport Canada, the Federal Transportation Department, maintaining their incident database and also including that in some of the research data that will be included within this report. And so they are admitting that they are years behind the Americans, but this project is still 30 years behind, but 30 years in the build and makeup. So Dave, I know you're super excited and I've hit some of the big points here, but do you have something that you'd like to add to this? Well, the one thing that I do want to add to it is we were the first show to give member of parliament, Larry McGuire, a long interview about this subject. He and the rest of them, are not interested in UAP. They are interested in UFOs. They're just using the new term in trying to find out what is going on in Canadian airspace. Okay, this is why when the drone was shot down over, over the Yukon Territory, they knew right away and kept and kept it public that this wasn't a UFO. OK, that they described the object of uh, what it was. It wasn't a balloon. It was an object that was a, about the size of a small car. It was uh, it was uh, cylindrical in shape. OK, which sounds like a UFO, but at 40 miles an hour, it wasn't. It was a drone. OK, they are interested in why these UFOs seem to be hovering in hot spots like over Canada's nuclear energy facilities why there are, are certain areas like the lower mainland of British Columbia near Vancouver where there seems to be a hotbed of black triangle sightings they want to know about the strange lights that seem to appear over Montreal and in the northern territories as well there's a lot going on with these craft and Canada has a long history of UFO reports, you know, dating back to when, you know, a gentleman named Wilbert Smith was actually the leader of this subject in the 1940s and fifties going into the sixties before project blue book hit in the United States with J. Allen Hynek. The American government was actually contacting Wilbert Smith for his information and in trying to learn more about the phenomena. Now, 
the interesting part about this group is, like I told you months ago, with my information, my sources in Ottawa, they want to make this as scientific as possible. Not nuts and bolts like we see with the U.S. government, but the science behind what is flying in Canadian airspace. And if you recall that interview that happened July 2nd of last year with Larry McGuire, we knew that it was about trying to figure out how are they getting here? Where are they coming from? Are they a safety breach to Canadian pilots, both military and commercial pilots flying across Canada or over Canada to get anywhere else in the world? And this is where I get excited about this because Canada is not looking at this subject on a defense level. They are looking at the UFO subject from a practical scientific level that should be expected from groups like Galileo or even NASA for that reason. I don't like it, and I've expressed my opinion to my sources in Ottawa that NASA is a bunch of garbage, okay? And I explained why, that their study is is garbage, because they already know. The interesting part about this, though, and this is where I want you guys to think about this. There is one agency in Canada that is not playing the UFO game. Can you name it, Tim? Um, Department of Energy? No. The Canadian Space Agency, with its ties to NASA, they have been very vocal that there are no UFOs in the sky, including our most famous astronaut, a gentleman named Chris Hatfield, who was the commander for six months on the International Space Station, who has brazenly gone on very many media outlets to say there's no such thing as UFOs. They're not here. We never saw any while on the uh, International Space Station. I don't know what people are talking about. The Canadian Space Agency needs NASA. I don't want to say they're controlled by NASA, but I would say NASA has a very large influence in that. And that is the only agency. And in fact, I was going to be calling my sources in Ottawa tomorrow to kind of get an update. And I'm going to ask them about that. I'm going to ask him about why the Canadian Space Agency doesn't seem to hop on the woo train when it comes to UFOs. But I'm excited about this. And you know what? I think, and quote, and I, I may be wrong here, okay? But I think, depending on what comes out of that study in 2024, when it's done, I think we're going to see either absolutely nothing, which I doubt, or we're going to see some eye-opening information. Because remember, the Canadian government doesn't have to play by the American rules on this. And I'm curious to see what comes out of that, considering they will be talking to the U.S. about this. But more so out of the reports that have been filed by Canadian people, the public, pilots, privately and commercially, military as well. I'm curious to see what's going to happen and what comes out. I think we could get more than we bargained for. I love to hear your support for any space agency, whether it's NASA or the Canadian Space Agency. So I think that's fantastic. Oh, I, I'm, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I am not supporting the Canadian Space Agency on this. They've gone full on stupid like NASA has. But okay. Um, well, some sources that I have talked to reveal potentially over this summer we may get some historical whistleblowers from perhaps NASA or something like that. Um, and that would be fantastic if um, you know, they were protected and were actually allowed to tell the truth of some of the things that they were seeing while they were in space. I mean, that is the dream. That's the ultimate whistleblower, in my personal opinion. And if um, the Canadian space uh, program got on board with that, then I think we could have a great group of people that would come forward with a lot of truth. And the fact is, is that's where we kind of need to dig into. Um, but I think that what we're starting to see is um, a collaboration 
uh, you know, between the two countries, which I feel is fantastic because we know that there's deep existing data that can be shared. Um, but I mean, it does show that potentially there were uh, other organizations that were looking into UFO in Canada before this formalized program that they're talking about. And we, I mean, we let off with it being 30 years since they had a formal program, but um, doesn't it seem like there was um, some research being done at least in the past two years? Um, even Defense Minister uh, Harjit Sajan, I believe that's his name, um, was talking about UAPs with his staff back in 2021, I believe, and came out publicly and reported to members um, of his team and then spoke to Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon UAP task force, uh, who were briefing Canadian military personnel also back and forth. So it feels like this is maybe a program that was building um, and maybe in collaboration with the United States, they decided that this was more of a partnership that we needed. Absolutely. And we thank uh, Corrine Jean-Pierre, White House Press Secretary, for helping us bring this news from Canada. As you know, we all live in Canada up here. When we come back on the UFO report with Tim Senor, we're going to get more into UFO studies going on around the world and the NRO. All right. There we go. Hey, by the way, Sovereign Farts, if you drop an F-bomb on my country again, I'm going to keep dropping F-bombs on you. And if you were here, I'd drop an elbow right on your solar plexus. Oh. Yeah, then, pin you, then I'd hook the leg and pin you for the three count. Mm hmm. Dave knows Bigfoot. Be careful. Mm, looks like random guy is suffering from some gout, says he needs a foot massage bad. Bragging. Yeah. Only guy I know brags about a gout flare up. Right. This guy. Yeah. Random guy. So casual. Lily Pond, how are you? Third phase of moon. Good to see you guys here. Hope you guys are well. Are you guys coming to the Vegas party? You should. Yeah. It's a hop, skip, and a jump from Hawaii. Yep. Yeah. Derek Galloway's coming to the Vegas party. He's even bringing streamers with him. Streamers. There you go. I'm going to be so back home in Hawaii here soon. So get this. Here's here's something funny. My mother-in-law is over, okay? And I kind of like her sometimes, about 50% of the time. All right. That was a Fred Flintstone moment. So, Go for it. Okay. So her her 80th birthday is coming up here. And she's staying here through the weekend. I said, you know, we're going to take you for dinner on Saturday. I said, is there anything that you would like for your birthday party? I said, you know, because we'll get you a cake. We'll get you some party hats. And I'm like, do you want me to find an unemployed logger to maybe uh, strip for you? You know, like a stripogram or something like that. She's like, no. I'm like, no, seriously. I said, what if we got you a male stripper or something like that? Right. She's like, I don't think so. I'm like, well, I'll try and find one if you really want one. And I just kept on digging into this, right? Because I'm annoying that way. I'm like, really? I, I, I honestly will. I'll try and find you one. You know, it might be tough, but. Don't so, tell me she caved. No, she didn't cave. Oh, my gosh. I was just hearing the, the Lumberjack song from Monty Python the whole time. Mm. Mm. random guy says my toes are long like fingers i can pick up objects you probably got webbed feet too is, is that a good thing uh, i i wouldn't think so uh hi uh, stephanie jackson and yes uh third phase you and everybody else is invited to our vegas party may 19th through 21st 
at the Golden Nugget. We'd love to see you all there. And uh, um, uh, Derek Galloway, we got to support the Las Vegas Raiders. Our quarterback, Derek Carr, he may be damn good looking and those those beautiful eyes that he had, you know, but the guy can't win. He's never been able to win. He can't take us to the playoffs. He's a prototypical 10 and six quarterback or nine and seven quarterback. We got to get a good, a good quarterback. We need to draft a good quarterback this year. We have to a franchise type quarterback, groom him for a year and a half and then give him the, give him the gears and let him go. Debbie Levin. Welcome to SOR chat. Trying out my new stealth account, Deb from sack. Okay. Okay, guys, if I ever greet you elsewhere, you know it's me. Okay, Deb, we can do that. And let's see. I mean, when you have offensive threats like the Raiders do, from their running back to Hunter Renfro, who never drops a ball, You got to get a quarterback who has a has an arm, not a pus arm, you know, but an actual cannon of an arm to get him the football. You know, we need a we need a Josh Allen type of guy. We need a um oh, what's his name? Cincinnati quarterback, Joe Burrow kind of guy. You know who I would take a chance on, to be honest with you? Because he will be a free agent after this year. Oh, God. Now, what's the kid's name? It was Cleveland's quarterback. And then he started playing for San, uh, San Diego, not San Diego, for the LA uh, Chargers or Rams. Oh, here we go. Round and third, we're heading for home tonight on Space Down Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on with little Timmy Sino, our resident Timbit, and the UFO report that is going on. And before we get to this NRO stuff, former chief for defense contractor that ran Area 51 Claim knowledge of recovered flying saucer and live beings. Now, now this is written in the Liberation Times by Christopher Sharp. And, you know, when we go to overtime after this show on our YouTube channel, we are going to have to ask Random Guy about this because he's got some sources. And, uh, you know, like he said the other night on overtime, there ain't no aliens in Area 51 or any place in the United States that he knew of. Yet, this could be something a little bit different. What's going on here, little Timmy Senor? Or we're there, right? I, I mean, every time I get another piece of information, it throws another stick of dynamite into the barrel of what I thought I knew. And so it's good. You know, I think it should be that way. And I'm definitely open to new information, and we all should be. And so with this new article written here by Christopher Sharp, Alfred O'Donnell, a senior manager of EG&G, the defense contractor that managed Area 51, claimed that, quote, they did have a flying saucer that had been recovered from New Mexico and a live being. And so according to investigative journalist George Knapp, who interviewed him on numerous occasions, when speaking about the being told him, that we didn't know what it was, and to tell you the truth, we couldn't communicate with it. In the beginning, we didn't know what it was, 
and we didn't know where it was from. And in fact, we didn't know what to do with it. So Knapp added that O'Donnell compared the being's appearance to former president nominees Ross Perot, unlike the classical gray-looking alien, and in a further description said, small head, large ears. And Knapp also shared a story about a former female employee of defense contractor Holmes and Narver, who allegedly had knowledge about, quote, crash saucers, recovered materials, and what sounded like a Roswell-type incident. And so before Knapp was scheduled to speak with her, the woman was intimidated by unknown agents, which caused her to cancel the meeting. Even after two decades, she continued to refuse a meeting. And so there's speculation around the alleged recovered craft that led to a congressional staffer's overseeing with the Special Access Programs, or SAPs, named Richard D'Amato, investigating the claims. And so in the early 1990s, former Senate Majority Leader Robert Baird, who the chair of Senate Committee on Appropriations, or the late Senator Harry Reid, who would later serve as a Senate Majority Leader, tasked with D'Amato with investigating this topic. And so investigating and visiting Area 51, D'Amato was unable to verify the claims related to the crash saucers. But according to Knapp, though it entirely feasible that this UFO cover-up exists within a private company. And so a company such as Lockheed Martin, EG&G, or Northrop Grumman. So in another quote here, we have this statement. In the 1980s and 1990s, I served on the staff of the Senate, Senate Democratic leader, Senate Senator Robert C. Beard, and my responsibilities involved helping manage the budgets of the Department of Defense and the National Foreign Intelligence Program. My duties included responding to a senator's and committee's request for information, analysis, and legislation on a variety of national security issues. In this context, a senior senator, I'm sorry, a senior Senate committee chairman asked me to conduct a preliminary inquiry into the allegations that came to his attention regarding unidentified aerial crashes in the 1940s in New Mexico. And so continuing, he met with a number of people who had made public statements on the matter and reported the conclusion to the senator that the basis for such allegations did not appear to merit any further Senate investigation. And so beyond this inquiry on behalf of the senator, there was no personal opinion on the matter and consider the inquiry to have been closed for over 20 years. And so now with this new information coming forward, there are some new possibilities that there were some doings going on at Area 51 that we may not know about. There were some other possible explanations for what went on there, including um, some research had been done by uh, a journalist and author, Annie Jacobson, for instance. And in this version, uh, in her book, she described Area 51 as the uncensored history of America's top secret military base. And she details how O'Donnell, although not named in the book, told her that Roswell incident was not the result of a non-human intelligence, but in fact, a Russian craft with grotesque, I'm sorry, grotesque, childlike aviators developed in human experiments by Nazi doctor and war criminal Joseph Mengele. And so after visiting Russia following the Cold War, Knapp himself disputed O'Donnell's version of Roswell, though the Russian contacts, including a few of the aerospace scientists whose mentors were Sergei Korolev, the father of Soviet Union space program. Knapp discovered that the Russians were just as mystified about this as I'm sorry, that the Russians were just as mystified about the Roswell incident as Americans. So, so much mystery, but some new light possibly shed on the potential truth of craft and bodies at Area 51. Another witness coming forward and pretty credible, seeming like they actually ran Area 51. So many questions I've got. So many questions. I'm sure you do too, Dave. But after seeing this and reading this article, where are you at with this? I don't know because I believe our random guy 
when he says that there aren't any aliens out in the desert. But on the flip side, Random Guy is not that old. I mean, he's old, but he's not that old. And could this bid before his time? Could be. But I think we need to know. You know, this goes into, you know, Tim, how many times have you heard me say that there is this UFO Pandora's box that sits somewhere 87 stories below the Pentagon or wherever, in the catacombs of the Pentagon, yeah, where all of these type of secrets are held. And I think this is another one that gets wrapped into that. This is a story where I want to believe it. I do. Why wouldn't I? I want to believe that the U.S. has had contact with extraterrestrial entities. I don't believe Roswell was a Russian spy balloon or or whatever it may be. Don't believe that for a second. But I will say this. I think that if they have crash retrievals and they've had extraterrestrials during that time, those bodies or those craft would have been taken to one of two places, Wright Patterson or Area 51. What we've learned since May, no, June, about Area 51, I'm not so sure if it would have been there. But nonetheless, we have we do have to look at it as one of those plausible stories that is locked in that Pandora's box that is sealed forever under the tag of disclosure. And this is another story that confirms for me why we never, ever will get disclosure. Yeah. Why it's confirmation. Yeah. And consider also that in the uh, weaponized video that was created by George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell about what this article is about, um, they go into detail about um, other bases that are implied, such as an Area 52 or S4, I think it would have been called, or um, they also have very descriptive, um, um, they, they get very descriptive about locations using terms like uh, Creech for Indian Springs and some of the original names of what Area 51 was before it was Area 51 and there, implying that some of the alien tech and uh, bodies were there before it was even area 51. And so perhaps some of that history has just been swept away. And so there is no remnants of it. Why would they leave any lingering evidence of that even at all? So um, some of what they talk about is Papoose Lake being uh, uh, whatever S4 is now called. But again, that's never been verified. It's still just out there and they're implying it in this tale of Area 51 and the mystery of the bodies that were retrieved from Roswell. And somehow they are intermingled. One doesn't have to be true if the other is, you know, and they, they're not interchanging on truth. Um, but I do find that the description of S4 being nine hangers and then Lazar's story being of nine craft and that it seems very possible. And we saw historically that they would love us to believe that there's UFOs and it's nothing more than potentially that. And we saw how historically the CIA duped uh, people that they knew were going to be journalists in the public eye. Linda Moulton Howe was fed a story by Richard Doty and they talk about that. Why couldn't George Knapp have been fed the same story by O'Donnell or the people um, surrounding him to keep that story going, you know, and even it's lingering to this day, see how he's even manipulated a filmmaker to um, get on board with the story. Now, I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm just saying that it, you can see historically how potentially they can manipulate the story and get belief across it through journalism. Um, and so it's very dangerous to have any real solid foundation of belief from anywhere we need evidence. And that's what RG is going to bring to the table, that there's no evidence. And that's hardcore. But 
again, it lingers. There's so many questions still, Dave, I'm sure. Oh, there. look, when it comes to something like this, when, you know, I always ask the question, where's the proof? What is proof? You've heard me say that dozens of times. But the thing that I, in something like this, there is proof. Okay, there's proof in the details. There's proof in the reports. There's maybe proof of video, okay, that is being held on to if this story is true. And when it comes to something like this, I think hearsay is dangerous. Now, I know I may be contradicting myself. There's going to be somebody who tries an aha, caught you moment here. Okay. But what I'm looking at here, Tim, is when you have government facts like this, okay, if it is indeed factual, there's going to be a paper trail. There's going to be a film trail and maybe an audio trail somewhere. It's not like Joe or Jill six pack who all they have is an anecdotal story of driving in their car that's hit by lights. And the next thing you know, they got four hours of missing time. You're not prepared to record that. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Big difference. Big, big difference. And I want to know what that difference is. Where is that difference? And this is why I tell everybody, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but this is where we see confirmation over disclosure. And I can see where the UFO community gets upset with these stories, these old antiquated stories that keep coming up over and over and over again. The unfortunate part about it is we're in for another 20, 30, 40, 50 years of these exact same stories until we get some finalized answers. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, but let's also recognize that Area 51 wasn't even outed until Obama's administration. They didn't finally admit that. So would you consider if they were to say that S4 existed, that that was a link to the Lazar story and so craft and so bodies and so potentially this story we're seeing held before us here by O'Donnell? Well, I mean, it all depends what S4 is, right? It all depends. If it is a below ground base and it has levels and things like that, and it's hidden by, you know, desert camo and such. Exactly. Or is it just a building that's tucked into a mountain? We don't know. It's tantalizing. We don't no. Let's move on to our final story. We've got five minutes. The NRO, Black Projects, what's going on here? In 2021, a highly classified system within the National Reconnaissance Office, or the NRO, detected what it described as a small 10-meter tic-tac-shaped object, which did not match the visual signature of typical aircraft detections. And so what we're seeing here is potentially another Tic Tac event being reported through uh, what was a freedom of information request made by the Black Vault. And so the system observing this object is called, quote, sentient. And this program with the NRO, wherein details remain highly classified, sounds like something you'd hear about described in a science fiction movie rather than a full operation by the American intelligence community. And so sentient is, or at least aims to be, an, uh, an analysis tool capable of devouring data of all sorts, making sense of the past and present and anticipating the future, and pointing satellites toward what it determines will be the most interesting parts of the future. And so that is a pretty interesting description, um, but it does details. Um, there are details uh, available through The Verge on more about the sentient. And so it seems that at least one of sentient's capabilities was, was revealed by a 2022 release of multiple documents under the FOIA. And it seems to be detecting UFOs. 
And so on record, proving that was brought to attention by the Black Vault last week, um, that it looks like originally sent to the DOD's office of the Inspector General and then forwarded to the NRO to review. The UAP detection occurred on 6 of May in 2021, and multiple records released by the NRO can be pieced together to deduce some minor details. And so the details are that it was said that the unknown object was vaguely similar to uh, what is considered an airborne object by U.S. Navy aircraft and surface vessels as the, quote, this is redacted and another description redacted operating areas. And so the location where this object was detected may remain unknown, but at one point, the presentation being released by the NRO links past U.S. Navy sightings and describes this new detected object as roughly similar to the previously reported Tic Tac shape, likely referring to the 2004 Nimitz encounter. And so likely not a sensor artifact or a focal plane anomaly, they want to re reinforce that a sensor artifact anomaly was not likely and a second sighting of the UAP was detected by at least one other sensor. And so it was, dis it was visible, um, let's see, for two to 15 seconds. And then as I'm looking down through this report, it doesn't give too many more details. And it looks like a lot of it has been redacted. But what we are looking for are more reports like this because it's going to give us details. Okay, so the system detected the presence of the vessel and it's calling it that from 25 kilometers away. And so they're able to identify these things with pretty pinpoint accuracy, and um, they are able to connect other incidents through this new system. So it looks like they've got a great system up, and we may hear little scattered bits of information like this, but sentient, is this something you're aware of? And it's a new, um, it's a new operating system to me. And so I'll be looking forward to hearing more about it. It sounds a little bit ominous, doesn't it? It does. It does. You know, and I'm always wary about stuff when it comes to the NRO. You know why? Their slogan is, we own the night. <laughs> really? Had I known that before I chose this, slow, our slogan to be, we own the night. I, I would uh, may not have used it. May not have used it. Well, sentient is being used to point our satellites at potential future UAP incursions. So it it analyzes how they work and then looks to where it thinks it may show up again. That's very interesting because reading between the lines there, that is exactly what it's saying. So. Fantastic details dug out by the Black Vault, but it yes. leads me to so many more questions, Dave, and it proves that Big Brother is absolutely watching and oh, yeah. possibly is predictive texting where to look for UAP. Absolutely. You're a UAP guy. You'll always be a UAP guy. Well, I mean, that's the stuff that we can detect, right? UFO is impossible to, de to detect, in my personal yeah. opinion. UFOs are detected every day. Oh, it's, man, they're hard to capture on film. Yeah, I'll tell you where they are. Have before. Hey, thank you, Timmy, for that amazing, amazing report. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in, at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat room tonight. YouTube, Twitch, Elgap, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio. And SOR Media Ventures Limited, thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. 
because together, my friends, in the inner row, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. If you want to bring a friend, we got room for them, too. Good night.